right down to your TV 314. This is your brother, Bianchi, the Ty Moon to the I'm on Ra. And today we got another powerful show for you. But before we get into it, let me do my usual spiel. Let me say hotel to my fellow comedic brothers and sisters. Let me say God bless to all my Christian brothers and sisters. Let me say Islam to my Moorish brothers and sisters. Let me say assalamu alaikum to my brothers and sisters in the NOI. Let me say shalom to my Hebrew Israelite brothers and sisters. And let me say peace to my brothers and sisters in the nation of gods and earths. And for those who remain, let me say jumbo for the rest of y'all in the African dysphoria, whether you're here in the wilderness of the United States of America or beyond. As y'all know, I say that greeting for one reason and one reason only. If you're black, I'm with you and I hope that you're with me. Our different ideologies shouldn't keep us from uniting. We can disagree without being disrespectfully disagreeable, and we can have unity without uniformity. And with that, my brother, B. Wash, welcome back to the program. Let's get into it. <laughs> uh, man, what's going on, good people? Uh, it's your boy, brother Byron Washington here, representing on this, uh, on this good, cool afternoon. Uh, with our brother Pianchi, man. So yeah, let's get into it. This is gonna be an interesting discussion. Uh this this is really just meeting, you know, just just us talking, kind of like you know, that barbershop afternoon talk. We're not here, you know, trying to uh is it's not really a debate. I don't really I don't, I don't really see how this topic could be, you know, what we talk about, I don't really see how it's a debate. It's either you know what happened and what happened and didn't happen, and then how we understand it today. Uh, in today's terms and, you know, how do we reconcile certain things? So I think that's, it's, it's a good topic for anybody uh, who is uh, pro, in my opinion, pro-Black, African, if you authentically uh, interested in, in Christianity, whether it be a faith or just from a, a spiritual tradition, I think this is important for everybody to take some of the nuggets that we talk about to dive in for yourself, because none of us here are experts. So I want to say that first, I ain't expert. I'm leaning on expertise of experts. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I, I, I just wanna, I wanna say this from the gate. Uh, this not a situation where me and my brother are here to, uh, to hash out disagreements or, or anything like that. This is just our brother telling us what he knows about a particular subject matter me just asking questions so it's not it's not a debate it's not a point of contention this is actually him teaching uh from a position of knowledge and me and and a lot of y'all in the audience listening from a position of ignorance and for those who know about it just being updated on it or seeing somebody else who know about it so this this will not be a debate whatsoever this just happened to be a subject that i have a lot of interest in so and I hope that it, it educates or edutains, as I always say, uh, a lot of the listening audience. With, with that being said, though, bro, let's, 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 let's put something on the table real quick that I think is important as we get into this conversation. Two things. Uh, the common motif throughout our community and for a long time uh, has been that Christianity is the white man's religion. And there is a conflation with Christianity and white supremacy. Break down uh, your stance on those two things, number one, and then we'll get into the meat, so to speak, of, of what we're here to do. And it, there's so many avenues to uh, really attack the, the notion of white man's religion, to, and white supremacy, um, but but I guess the best way to look at it is, you know, with anything, you got to take into effect um, the history and where it spread to from its beginning, and then what changed in certain people groups. So I went from Christianity. I look at it from like a historical perspective. You know, we know that it spread to as far east as China, you know, to to Russia, to India, to course the mother continent africa and europe and you know in the first five six centuries we know that but you know 
we here in America in particular are, you know, our children, our grandchildren of a particular expression of a latest Christianity. And it's marriage to secular ideologies like um, doctrine of discovery, manifest destiny, stuff like that, white supremacy for the most part. So I always look at it as, all right, let me see what's the outlier. Does the outlier represent what the faith tradition is talking about? And for most people that I, you know, that I know of, especially, you know, who, who are, who know Christianity, know New Testament Christianity in some way, form or fashion, they will at least acknowledge to say, you know, they don't really have a problem with, with the Messiah and his teachings. They have a problem really with the expression of what has happened here, that tool. And so, I tell people all the time, you know, it's like a hammer, man. Like a hammer is meant to build homes. And if you hear some of the background, that's my, I got a one year old, three year old, y'all. So, I, you know, I, I'm unapologetically a proud father. So I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna, uh, <laughs> right. back, I ain't gonna never apologize for being a daddy. Nor, nor, nor should you. And if people <laughs> don't understand that, they in the wrong place. <laughs> so, uh, so for me, like I said, a hammer thing, man, you know, a hammer can build a house, but it also uh, can tear down a house, but it also can be used for violence. You know, um, people have been bludgeoned to death by hammers and, and on both sides of it, stuff like that. Is that the intention of the hammer? No. Is that the intention of the person who made the hammer? No. Is that the use of 90% of the people who have hammers in their house, what they do with it? No, they don't, I don't go to Lowe's and Home Depot to get a hammer with the intention of one day using it to go and bash my neighbor upside the head, you know? Um, and so that's my take when it comes to Christianity and white supremacy. I think there's, and I say that, you know, real shortly, cause there's at this point in time, and this was five years ago, we can do a whole show on it, right? But I think there's plenty enough material from both uh, Christians and even non-Christians at this point to at least to show that uh, Christianity as a faith is not, married to white supremacy it has nothing to do with it uh white supremacy in its own thing is almost its only ideology and religion in and of itself when you really think about it and uh you know that's kind of always th that that's been my take but i understand also that from an indigenous people and african people the way our faith traditions are made real is by how we express them. And so you if you're an indigenous American or, or you're an African and you see somebody professing Jesus, but their actions are heinous, ungodly, et cetera, et cetera, in your worldview, then that means that faith tradition produces that expression. But not understanding in those specific Europeans' worldview, they can separate uh ex you know spiritual expression and separate you know secular expression, church and state essentially they can they can go to church service on a sunday and then you know go to a hanging that afternoon and see no problem with it i've been pray pray to god and then uh go out and, and and see how many native american skulls you can crack open and take the skin from um that's you know they can they can separate that we we don't come from a culture um that that can do that so i understand why we had that response of looking at christianity and saying like man this this is a this is white supremacy because it's like almost two worldviews clashing and we have to go and look at to see um you know what's the authentic truth while who represents what and to our credit we got a bunch of African and indigenous peoples that have been calling out the fake Christianity in the, in the Americas long before you and I were even thought of our ancestors who fought for our freedoms on this land. They were calling this out long, long, long ago, you know? And so, uh, yeah, man, that's, that's, that's kind of my little, little, uh, pre, pre topic, uh, diatribe, I should say. Well said, bro. Well said. And I, I wanted to get that out the way off the bat before we even got into the subject matter. So I think you you covered it uh, 
tremendously. So let's get into the uh, the meat of why we're here, <laughs> and let's talk about the the Coptic Church and the Nubian Church from from an ancient standpoint of uh, the Nile Valley and its impact on uh, Christianity then and now. Uh, and just start with uh from the beginning and I'll you know I'll interject you know where where necessary for me to get an understanding but other than that I'm gonna let you rock right so so I'm gonna start with acknowledging uh what we would call kind of the four maybe five but I'll say four ancient continental African uh, and I use that term continental African because Africa, um, as we know it, it uses the term is anachronistic. Those people that they didn't they didn't have a concept of a continental Africa the way we do. And so you could be, and I'm using the side of you can be as African as we see it today, and have been born in like Rome, or been born in Antioch or Arabia or uh, Turkey. You know, like you know. We was everywhere, so we, you know, our our our, our heritage just does doesn't is it limited just continental Africa? But for the sake of this discussion, I'm a, I'm gonna use the terms on continental Africa. Um, we, you have uh, the Coptic Church, which is based, which, which is Egyptian. Uh, for those who don't know, Coptic and Egyptian are are literally the same terms. Uh, it's just the uh, the Greek the the Greek rendition of it versus the Latin rendition of it. Um, uh, you also have the North African church, uh, which is basically like a Berber church. And I say North Africa, at the time they would call it Africa because anywhere basically to the west of Egypt um, proper um, would have been, they would, in North Africa, would, they would call it Africa because again, they didn't have a term for the continent. So actually it's Africa, Proconsulars and a couple of other names as well too, but all we we just call it today North Africa, so we know that we're not talking about the continent versus the people. And, and real quick, bro, for the for the people who who have slow gases and who gonna you know try to get upset with my brother, <laughs> he's using colloquial terms that people are used to mm -hmm. when he's talking about these places. So. I don't want to hear or see in the comments. Why didn't he say Kimmy? We know and understand the difference between Kemi and Egypt right. from a cultural sense. But he's talking about just from a geographic sense and from an understanding that people outside of our community may not know. I just want right. to get that straight before we even start hearing that. I appreciate, I appreciate that, man, because because and to be clear, I'm using terms that general academia, you know, learn. When you, if you Google, you're not going to find a lot of uh, scholars using the term comedic. They should, but we just, they don't. Um, and same way for Africa. Um, and same way for really, um, and it, those are the other two churches, but the other churches that I'm going to name, Nubia. Um, the Nubian Nubian Church and the Ethiopian Church, and even 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 Ethiopia uh, is a mis I won't say a misnomer, but uh, at the time they would have referred to themselves as Abyssinian more than Ethiopian because Ethiopian they adopt, that that country adopts that that name, nomenclature uh, I want to say in the eighteen hundreds I could be wrong but sometime sometime later um, at the time they would have been been referring to themselves as the Abyssinian Empire. Uh, or some other some other iteration, but again, using these terms so people can have a geographical understanding. Um, and so, the two churches that still exist today, that would be the uh, the Coptic Church uh, and the Ethiopian Church. And I want to say, off the Ethiopian Church, you also got the Eritrean Church, uh, which is I think about a decade or so old, coming off the Ethiopian Church. Uh, the two churches that are in their proper sense and no longer in existence would be the North African church uh, and the Nubian church. And so, uh, so those churches are the ones for me that I wanna know more about because I, I kind of know why both of them don't exist anymore. Um, but there's still a lot of history within both of those churches that have been 
kind of engulfed in other uh, traditions. And so a lot of times we don't even know the Africanness, and, and I'm using that term loosely, but the Africanness, the blackness, whatever term you want to call it, of expressions of Christianity uh, and theology because it's been just kind of engulfed into some broader, a lot of times more European expressions. And so, you know, that's that's something for us as we continue to talk, we'll dive into and kind of see that dichotomy of what happened. But yeah, starting with that, you got those four, uh, what we call ancient African churches. Um, and then from there, you get surprisingly, you uh, to, to, and again, I don't wanna shock, I hope this don't shock people, uh, you you get infiltration into forms in, in West and Central Africa. Again, not a majority, not a majority. Not saying that everybody in West Central Africa is Christian, not, not by a long shot. But what we're saying is that because of those other ancient churches, that you get a natural uh, uh, flow, missionary flow, whatever you want to call it, into sections in West and Central Africa, which shouldn't be a surprise for anybody here because we know Africans throughout history have always uh, traded been intersectional with each other. And so it is not, we should be shocked. Actually, we should be more offended that, that we didn't already assume that they had some type of Christianity in Western Central Africa before a European ever stepped foot there. Because if we know they were already trading and you know ideas and people moving to and fro, all of a sudden, like when it comes to this faith thing, you know, it's like, a, I ain't never heard of that, but we have no problem accepting that Islam made it to West and Central Africa uh, without, with, through, through other Africans and Arabs. But, you know, apparently we, we with West Africa, it's just some imaginary border that Christianity could never find its way to touch um, in, in forms of fashion. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at uh, with it right now, at least establishing those ground rules so we know the areas that we talk about and the, the ancient expressions that we talk about. There it is. There it is. And so from that standpoint, so a lot of the the a lot of talk or a lot of discussion is around from from my community anyway, is around this uh the idea or the notion, theory, uh how, well, however you want to put it, that even from an ancient standpoint. Uh, Christianity was spread to the continent violently. In other words, our, uh, our Coptic uh, or Kemetic, our Kemetic ancestors um, who became Christians did so without choice. It was either that or be persecuted unto death, torture, etc. And then, and the same thing extending down down the Nile into to Nubia and Kush uh, in those areas. What what what's the real story um, based on the research that you've done and the knowledge you've been able to attain with regards to when Christianity first started? I'm not talking about under the Roman Empire and beyond, but when it first started and went into the continent those African ancestors of ours who converted over, was it through persecution or was it through their own volition? As far as what you, as far as what you discovered. So, so uh, it would be, and, and, and further I want to say shout out to our brother, Nobody. I see he, he's, he just logged in. So uh, nobody, I just want to get on the floor, get an intro, intro good brother. Peace, peace, How y'all doing, man? Y'all doing all right? We doing good. We good, man. We good. Get, get, getting a history lesson from uh from our residential <laughs> uh African Christianity scholar on Paradigm Shift TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. I heard Byron Bar was supposed to come on the day and gone and uh uh give his spiel, man. Yeah, I'm I'm tuning in, man. You know, Byron to show you show you some support. I might not say too much, but I'm I'm here in um support of you, bro. Appreciate you, man. Yeah. But yeah, man, to, so so PT, your original thing, man, uh, the answer would be no. Um, that it did not spread to our comedic 
ancestors because because it spread it, it, it spread to Kemet first and foremost. So I want to put that clear: when Christianity spread into Africa, it spread into Kemet first. That's where you get the not only the what we would call the Septuagint or the old. Uh, Old Testament, but that's where you get most of your New Testament writings are written, especially the Gospels are written in or are, are copied in uh, ancient Kim. So uh, that it, that is where uh, it begins uh, to spread throughout Africa um, through the Apostle Mark. But it, in its beginning, remember Christianity is a, a a looked at as a Jewish sect. So you know, Judea it, it's it's the Roman Empire, right? Then some knocks down, you get to Ju Judaism. And then it's not even like, you know, the primary Jewish say, where you got the Sadducees and Pharisees and stuff like that. It's looked at this like this kind of like little offshoot deal. So really and truly, the people aren't even worried about Christianity at that point in time. You know, they're kind of looking like, man, you know, they do talk about this, 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 this brown guy that we killed that they allegedly saw come back, you know, blah, blah, blah. But um uh as we as we see it spreading in ancient Kemet, uh and and as they spread to other parts of africa what you see is that they're interacting with the gospel and their native spiritualities and so i won't say like there's never any violence because there's always violence wherever you are. i don't care who you are i'm not i'm not being fantastical but in in spreading of that faith violence was not a key factor because a it was a, it was they were almost like a non a nine issue with these people. And then two, uh, the Roman Empire uh, for at least the first 300 years persecuted Christians. And so you actually had more um, black and brown Christians being persecuted in these coliseums, being fed to wool, wolves, lions, bears, and stuff like that. As a matter of fact, um, if you look at the Coptic Church and some of the writings of the North African Church, they also looked at the Church of the Martyrs because um, one of the sayings is that you can put all the martyrs from 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 Coptic, Egypt, and North Africa and put them on the scale, and uh, and put it across all martyrs across the world, and it wouldn't even come close. Meaning that they were killing so many Africans for just professing being Christian, it was ridiculous. Um, a blood, it was bloody. Uh, for just professing that faith. And so uh, when we talk about that spread, no, man, during that point in time, uh, that spread was just purely spiritual, intellectual, uh, whatever you want to call it, but it was not something to where you had to get down or lay down. Um, in fact, it was it was quite the opposite. It's actually easier for somebody to say they were not Christian and live than to just say they were Christian uh, which was almost a death sentence for a lot of times. So. Uh, talk about a little bit about something that me, you and I have talked about a lot, and that's the commonalities uh, that our African ancestors in, in Kemet and beyond saw between African, they, the African spiritual concepts that, that were indigenous to where they were from and and Christianity and why those commonalities helped with their conversion, if that makes sense, if that makes sense. Gotcha, gotcha. Um I'll go one is uh you gotta look at A, I always start with that whole region, that whole region from the Sahel to the Nile Valley to Mesopotamia to Arabia to the Levant, all these people knew each other. You know, this, you know, they knew they came from similar cultures, languages were similar, um, traded with each other, they interacted. So there wasn't, there was never this kind of like shock, who are these people? Uh, two, as kind of you and I talked about before, at least, you know, with Christianity in the Old Testament or, or, or the Israelite religion, um, outside of really the Exodus narrative, you don't really see a major tension between the Israelites and people we term as Africans today, pre-Exodus narrative and post-Exodus narrative. Um, you don't see this big, like, you know, a lot of people in the community try to put this Israelite versus Kemet in. Like, it's not really, it wasn't really like that. Um, they didn't really have beef. Like, in fact, uh, they were more favorable with uh, 
with ancient Kemet and Ethiopia and Nubia uh, with relations even for aid, you know? Um, and so, uh, you know, I want to get that out there first. Like there was already, they, they didn't have this war intention. Um, but then as we get to the Christian, Christian understanding is a lot of the same concepts that um, Christianity teaches and expresses. Um, ancient Africans committed beyond already had kind of a foundational understanding of the principles. So, you know, principles as resurrection, principles as a, a supernatural world of good and evil, uh, a supreme being, creator being, having subordinate beings under that creator being. Um, you know, the, 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 human, the human being trying to get back to its original divine nature. These type of things, um, you know, were not new. The, the idea of uh, a God King, you know, Christ being that God King, but having just that idea, that foundational of, of, of a priestly godly King that's a prophet. Uh, these, these, these things were not new in and of themselves. Um, and so when they, when they get the scriptures for a lot of times, uh, you get them seeing a, a, like a full realization of their already native spiritual traditions. They kind of see like, oh, this is the cop. This is what the shadow of things are alluding to. They're trying to point us to, um, but still keeping again, their their native African cultures, traditions, languages, but just understanding with the gospel when it's presented to them, they didn't have to. They didn't have to. Um, understand new concepts as in a way that when Christianity reached other cultures, I say that, um, that they had to relearn, what it, What do you mean resurrection? What do you mean the dead are not actually, you know, they're dead, but there's a, there's an afterlife. Uh, the good, the deeds, that the things that you do, you will be judged for in the afterlife, what you do today. Um, you know, stuff like that. Other cultures, they had to learn that from a, a base ground level. Uh, Africans, as you know, especially in comedic in the comedic world, that was not something that they had to learn, um, had to understand, uh, anything like that. They were like, "We already at, <laughs> we already at eight, you know, while everybody else at, at, at level one, level two, you know, we already we masters." And, and you get that because your earliest theologians, Christian theologians, most of them are African or what we call Afro Asiatic. Again, yeah, not all. But most of them, because they like, we, we already understand this, these concepts. We grew up with these worldviews and concepts and, uh, and understanding what things meant. Um, you know, the, 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 the marriage of the natural and the supernatural, all this type of stuff, man. So um, it, that's why for them, you know, it, you see such a smooth transition, especially in, in our African cultures. Uh, when they when they decide to 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 go into the Christian faith, it's just like, hey, you know, we this stuff we already know, and it, it just really illuminating more what we we already understand. Gotcha, gotcha, and it to me it seemed like, thank you, son. It seemed like people have a hard time accepting that, kind of on both. On, on both ends of the spectrum, but particularly on the uh, the African spiritual side or the pro-black side that Africans, black Africans actually converted to Christianity willingly at that earlier stage in history. And it's like, if they did it by choice, you could be upset with them for doing it, but let's not make up uh, scenarios as to why they did it. If they did it willingly, respect their choice. Like, just, just put some respect on their choice uh, for whatever reason. If, if you want to say, like, you, you think they was manipulated, whatever the case may be, they made a decision to go this route after having grown up with this particular uh, belief. So, Let's talk about a particular uh, symbol or word in the comedic language that I think is probably one of the most misunderstood because of uh, co-opting 
because I always say Christianity was co-opted by Europeans and weaponized against indigenous people across the planet, particularly Africans, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this symbol it suffered the same fate. Uh, the unk. <laughs> and we know that in the comedic language, the unk is a symbol for life and it's the word for life. Uh, I've heard Christians question this. Um, I've heard uh, other other people say that it's an inversion of the cross. Uh, but if I'm not mistaken, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the Coptic church used the unk as a, they continue to use it as a as a spiritual or religious symbol. Talk talk about their use of it as it symbolizes that it wasn't, it isn't something that's a cultish or, e or to be viewed as evil, even from a Christian lens, so to speak. Because we know that certain, uh, you know, Aleister Crowley and all of these different individuals have taken, taken on the symbol. You know, you see people of European descent that call themselves goth or whatever. They have, they have a tattoo of uh, not even really understanding what it you what mean. it means from an African standpoint, but speak to to how the Coptics, uh, the Coptic Church viewed the um and how they used it some it with regards to uh, from a, from a symbolic standpoint. Right, right. I'm a first. I'm a first because uh, I forgot to put this point out there because uh, you mentioned something about people giving excuses away of why Africans would have converted. Because I've seen stuff to where. Like oh well, they were living in this in this uh, Hellenistic, Platonic, and blah 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 blah. And I always tell people, man, look, like read with them, read with those brothers and sisters wrote, you know, rather than superimposing that, giving reasons why they did and why they didn't. Read what they wrote, and they tell you why they did so. Um, because in the same way that you and I are of African descent, but we don't think as Europeans, right? We may use the language, we, we speak in English, but we don't think as Europeans. Um, in the same way, let's not discredit our ancestors who may have been brought up in a Greco-Roman society, may have spoken the language, but to accuse them of now, they're, they're now theologically uh, Hellenistic or Platonic or stuff, it's like that's, to me, I want to just put that out there for the for the for the viewing audience. Let's not do that because we don't want to disrespect to see assume on one end the greatness of these people, the minds, the things that they came up with. But all of a sudden, when they got to uh, Greco-Roman uh, rule, they became blind, deaf, and dumb and couldn't think for themselves. But then we don't hold that same measure for ourselves to say, you know, my last name Washington. I for damn sure don't don't have the same theological and worldview as George Washington, um, you know, and I speak English, I live in America, I'm an American citizen, uh, I'm participating in this democratic capitalist society, but that still don't mean I have the same worldview, thoughts and mindsets of Europeans. Let's not just, let's not do that to our people who weren't even removed from the land, like we were removed from our land. Those people weren't even removed from their land. So even with them being taken but, over, uh, you know, Go ahead. Yeah, my bad, about The Bible says that you are who your father is. So if George Washington your daddy, bro, you, you just you got to be just like him, bro. You, you're missing with him. Go ahead, bro. Hey, man. Hey, man. Get, get your ass off of here, man. <laughs> you, you are no longer welcome. <laughs> <laughs> my bad, bro. I didn't mean, mean to stop your flow. No, no, you good, man. That you good. I just want to put that out because I know that's a big objection a lot of times. It's like, oh, these were Grecanized Africans or Romanized Africans, and I'm like, man, that's interesting. How we all speak in English and on these uh on these social media platforms that they weren't created by African people, but we can, you know, we can we can have cognitive dis dissonance with that. But apparently, two thousand years ago, you know, our African ancestors just were blind, deaf, and dumb. They couldn't they couldn't understand the difference. That's a that's a powerful, so, that's a powerful. Right, right, and that's just logic, bro. Like, I mean, I'm, I, honestly, I'm 
I'm glad that you broke it down like that, but it's a shame in 2021 that you have to break it down like that when that should be common sense. That should be logic. Like you said, it's, we know people that move to other countries all the time, just within our lifetime, and they are still who, who they are. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, man, I, I, I agree with you on that 100%. And anybody who disagrees, well, what you what you gotta what you gotta yeah, understand, though, bro, is for the people who disagree. You get some people, like I say, you got some people that just got slow gas, but then you got other people who have ingrained biases based on experiences, based on um, just a level of disdain for Christianity regardless of what you say, and they just haven't looked into this information close enough, they've heard someone who they love and respect say, no, they it was at the end of a sword. That's it. They ain't got to do no research for themselves. They ain't got to go and try to educate themselves and get no knowledge. Such and such said it. That's it. Jabari Osazi said it, Baba Haru said it, Ashford Kwesi said it, and respect to all, all of them. I love them personally, but if they said it, that's what it is. I ain't got to look at nothing, but I got to go look at it for it. And so my point being, it, but but that's my point. It, that's not to say that they is necessarily doing something wrong. It's just that they've been quote unquote church hurt or they wouldn't raised in the church, whatever the case, whatever they, they personal scenario is with why they no longer a Christian or never was. And then again, somebody whose information they trust, somebody they admire, somebody they love, told them this is what it was. That person may be telling them because they really believe it. And that's what that's the information they got. It's it's many layers to it. It's a it's a this this a nuance. <laughs> Situation as to why people not aware of it. It's not just oh they just they just dumb. This is just not that's that's not how it works. And, 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 right, and I agree with you on that. Yeah, yeah, of course. I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to put that out there just because I know that's again that's it that before I got in about the the uh, cop did stuff like and everything. Hold on one second. Yeah, yeah if you if you to talk to me four years ago, I'd have been nah, bro. Straight like that. It's 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 uh they conquered and they, they, you know that that's that's what it was. It wouldn't it, 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 like I I'd be ready to fight y'all talking about some some Africans willingly converted to Christianity. You you know, you know what I'm saying? Not because because mind you, I'm not saying that all Africans did. Right. I'm just saying that the this is for this particular lesson. You're right. And 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 when and, and with this, I always say this when our greatest heroes, right? Malcolm, Martin, Harriet, Frederick. Last I checked, all of them, none of those names are African. Exactly. Uh, last time I checked, all of them spoke quote unquote the king's English. Last time I checked, all of them were at least for the for Malcolm and Martin, at least American citizens and and Douglas and Harriet fighting for that stuff. Nobody would accuse them of of, of having the same ideology as, as uh, their white owners, overseers, suppressors. You know, blase, blase. I'm pretty sure you wouldn't say Martin Luther King has the same ideology as George Wall, jo, uh, George Wallace, right? Um, but you know, it's so so we can so we can see that we we have a we we. We have enough sense. So I would just, like I say, I just tell people, get, gain the, the same respect you do to our more recent ancestors. Uh, do the same respect to the ancient ancestors and not assuming that they just was blind, deaf, and dumb. But um, to your original question, it's, so look at three things uh, from three different cultures, and it's crazy. Um, the first one, uh, biblical text, I'm going to use the term logos, right? That's a that, That's a platonic word. That, that is not biblical, um, that is not Hebraic, that is Platonic, that is Greco-Roman. But John, uh, St. John uses that term to express a thought and understanding. And so, you know, to my black brothers and sisters in the faith, you know, 
if you're going to get upset about an unk, you better be upset about using the term logos or the word because, again, that comes from a non-Christian understanding to express a thought that is true. So another example, you look at ancient Chinese culture, Christianity, I want to say in the six, 700s, they have the cross coming out the lotus flower. And anybody who's familiar with, you know, even baseline ancient Chinese uh, 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 symbolism, the lotus flower is like, you know, almost like equivalent to the comedic unk. You know, it, that's something that they take serious, which is a form of rebirth, uh, life giving, stuff like that. And so they have the cross coming out there. They're expressing a thought, a symbolism to say, you know, I, the rebirth is coming out of the lotus flower. I mean, you know, uh, giving you um, their idea of it. And again, and then shout out to the ancient Chinese Christianity because they didn't say Christianity, they call it the way or uh, Jing Zhao uh, in their language. And then you go into the comedic thought. And as you say, with the aunt, um, when they when they, when they, when they when they converted, they looked at these symbols and said, man, you know, like, Unk means life, life giving, uh, sometimes rebirth. We trying to express this stuff. It looks similar to the cross because, because contrary to what we all know, we don't that exact uh, 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 T looking figure. It you know it didn't look exactly like that. It's it's looking at broken wood, so we it, it could have been off angle or whatever. Um, but they see that in their culture, and they're like, we're gonna use this to express a thought. And it's and, and again, we're talking about a tradition that at this point is two thousand years old, and so it's almost like for you know no no disrespect to our, to our, our black brothers and sisters in the faith, but for you to question them on how their culture took the faith, I mean they've been doing something for two thousand years, and you superimposing that based off of some uh uh. European Gothic, uh, uh, Alice Crowley type of stuff that comes centuries and centuries later, and a misrepresentation, you know, to our brothers and sisters in faith, we gotta do better. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta give those people their credit, and they understand that what for them the um, pre-Christian, post-Christian, it still represents what it represents. It's the, it's it's always meant life, right? But now it's when they say life, what do they mean? Well, they're talking about through the Messiah, the Hamashiach. So, and, th and that's what they're expressing in, within that culture. And so for us to sit here and criticize them um, as, as, as believers, you know, and I, I, got, I had discussion with other believers too. I'm like, hey man, you know, you gotta, you gotta take a couple steps back real quick before you start criticizing African Christianity when it comes to that stuff, especially the tradition that's two thousand something years old. Like we gotta, you gotta fall back a little bit on that kind of stuff. And then also from our committee brothers and sisters, you know, well, like you said, uh, brother P, is showing them, hey, these people freely accepted the faith and they took what was native and cultural to them to express it. So they didn't need a uh, a Roman or a uh, English or a Russian or a uh, Arabic or Turkish understanding. They took what was native to them to convey a truth that they had always been a part of. And so, you know, on both sides, like you say, we have to um, become better at knowing what people are saying and meaning when they do certain stuff and understanding our collective history because it's still our collective history whether you agree with the faith or not it's still historical facts that these things happen and so we need to know what happened and why and for those of you who wonder why i always say when i had a brother on the program i'm just gonna say it again this is why i fuck with Byron Washington, period. But I'm gonna go. I'm gonna move on. Let let let's let's talk about how uh, Christianity, because we, you know, as for let's let before we 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 move on, let's let's talk about the development of the church in in Kemet and the formation of the Coptic Church, and then I want you to kind of segue as it moved down the 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 Hopi or the Nile uh, into, okay. into Nubia 
and the formation of that church. And then we'll talk about the impact it had on the faith, as it were, overall, as it, as it spread throughout the continent and uh, further up into Europe. But the impact and the elements of those two churches that it, that had on the overall church, if you will. So I would say um, um, I will I'll always start. We talk about African African Christianity. You got to start with ancient Kemet because, like I said, that's where it first began. And then your second one uh, station would be the, what would they call Carthage or North African Christianity. The impact. And you know, hold on to your horses. Some people may not like it. Some people are going to like it, but it is what it is. Um, the impact is a lot of the expressions that we attribute to European expressions are actually African in nature. So expressions like we talk about um, Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, High Church Anglicanism, stuff like that. You look at some of the, the, the wear the, the vestments, the the the, uh, the palms that they have. A lot of that stuff is actually you can find all throughout North Africa, or Northeast or Northwest Africa, pre-Christian. You know, the Kemetic priests, the Berber priests, the Libyan priests, all these the, the, these different priestly classes, they were always rocking this stuff as a means to understand the spiritual nature. So, of course, when Coptic Egypt or, or, or Coptic, uh, Coptic, Coptic Kemet um, gets a hold of Christianity, well, what's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to use your native traditions to express it. And so things that we assume, you know, we make fun of like the Pope hat and, the, and stuff like that, not understanding, bro, you can go actually go on the walls of Kemet right now and find the exact same hat. And in fact, what happens is a lot of times, this is where, where, where the, 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 the in line goes like our brother Jabari, you know, that when people have the accusation like, oh, Christianity is a copycat of comedic religion. And it's not it, it's not a copycat in that the people of that day only did what they were native to know to do. But because it spread to Europe, to Asia, and the other places, they took those same expressions and use it within European churches. If you go to Rome right now, there's a, uh, in the Basilica, there's a, 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 a long statuary uh, pyramid type figure. I can't even think of the name, I was about to say it, I couldn't think of it. Same, it's very similar to our, uh, uh, Memo uh, was it, not Lincoln Memorial, George Washington Memorial that we have here. Yeah, the, it's, it's, they call it an op, 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 but it's called, we call it a techie. There, there we go. And so, and, and it, for us, it was a symbol of resurrection because I said, fashioned this Tekken mm -hmm. uh, so that her and Asaur could conceive the ultimate savior of, of Kemet in, in Haru. And yeah, they, they, like, if you go to, you go to any cemetery right now. They're going to have one woman now. Is people who are Christians mm -hmm. that have a Tekken as they headstone, and knowingly or unknowingly, comedic culture permeates throughout Western civilization. That's why I, I would surmise that Norma is the father, is the true father of Western civilization, just because of the impact that Kemet has had on on the world. But like, it, it is it fair to say? Like when Jabari says they copy uh, Christianity as a copy of comedic spirituality or comedic science, is it fair to say that Europeans copied African or comedic or Nile Valley, however you, you want to express it, culture or and sort of superimposed it over their over their Christian expression. So they took African culture and superimposed it over and used it as their own expression of Christianity. So in essence, 
people like Jabari not necessarily they 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 may be off on saying Christianity the belief the belief is a copy but they not off on saying that they took our our, our social mores forkways etc and superimposed it over into their culture to formulate their expression of this belief if that makes sense Ali. That's um, and and that would be correct in this. Um, like I said, the two heavy hitters of ancient African foundation of Christianity is going to be Kemetic and I uh, 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 Coptic uh, later, and then your Berber North African. And so you look at like a lot of writings from like Tertullian, for example, or Cyprian, and they kind of give you some expressions, things that they would do, how they would pray to how they would fast in North Africa, for example. That's the first place where you get the sign of the cross in Berber. When they, they do it on their forehead and eventually it went down to their whole thing. Well, you go today and you see people doing this, the first place you're thinking, of, oh, that's you being Roman Catholic. Are you being Greek? Oh, not understanding, like, actually, it was North Africans that had started this tradition prior to. And if you don't go back and see why they did it, then you just assuming you know, it's association with say Roman Catholicism and Anglicanism. So what happens is you get native cultures in North Africa and in, in, in Egypt, they get Christianity, they express it culturally in whatever forms and fashions, vestments, expressions, whatever. And because they are considered the bedrock and foundation, especially from Western society, of Christianity and anybody, any any Christian scholar will tell you like North, Afri North African theologian and, and Christianity is the bedrock of Western Christianity foundation. Um, they take those things naturally and copy them and do them. Now they didn't do them maliciously, so I want to put that out there. It wasn't like the Romans and Greeks did it in a way to be wrong. They really did it in a way to say, man, these people. Like they really got this and we wanna we wanna express the way they express. But over time, um, as with a lot of things, things become Europeanized and, and stuff like that. And so when we get it today, uh, we automatically, like you got brothers Jabari and others who look at look, they'll look at that and they look at ancient comedic expressions and say, wait, hold on a second. Or you look at that and you look at ancient North Africans expressions, and you're like, hold on a second. Like Oh, they copying. But like you said, there's a middle ground in that. Don't say Christianity copied it because I can take you to this place. For example, even in Europe, Celtic Christianity. Their expressions were nothing like, like Roman uh, uh, Christianity. They were authentically you know, European. Uh, I can take you to uh, Russian. I can take you to... Um, uh, what they call Maritimus in India. They're, those expressions mirror the culture of that area. And so it, 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 it would be a misnomer to say that Christianity copied from African religions. What you could say, however, is that certain aspects of European Christianity use the same expressions of African Christians. And over time, they have never been given their due diligence and respect to where they got it from. And so now you superimpose that into a worldview that we all kind of are, are, have grown up into saying Africa is negative, Africans didn't know anything, we, we were the ones to, to come up with all of this stuff. And then also the other layer on top of that is uh, because of the Reformation in Europe, you have uh, a negative onlook on anything that looks Roman Catholic. And so we inherit that as well too. So it's kind of like we almost got a we almost got like a double portion of being disconnected from that again those specific areas African expressions. You got the you you got the 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 Roman Church basically disconnecting um, that history from Africa, and then you also got the Reformation that disconnecting anything that has to do with Roman Catholicism, and so when we inherit that. And we look at something that look Roman, like we don't even look at it and think, oh man, like like a comedic priest would have wore that. Pre-Christian or, or, or and a Coptic priest still to this day essentially wears that. 
And so, and I'm just using that as a foundation of where we at. And then we, from there, we go down to Nubia and, and the Coptic, they call it Coptic Church, the Coptic Nubian Church, uh, down, going down the Hopi, as you say, or going up the Hopi, let me be more correct in, in the flow. Um, you, you, you have that going on uh, in Nubia. And, and I'm saying Nubia, if you know anything about Nubia, it's like three different nations at that time. So it's not even just one Nubia, it's Nubias, but for the, for the, for the term of our, uh, our conversations, I'm just saying Nubia, three different uh, Nubian Christian kingdoms. And they're in the middle between them and Ethiopia as well too, who has its own history and founding uh, with Christianity and its own unique expressions. That's different from Nubia, that's different from uh, uh, Coptic Egypt, you know, uh, you know, because contrary to popular belief, period, you know, the Nile Valley civilizations, we got to put that plural because there were different, not just in ancient Kim and Nubia, but all of these different nations who, who from the Great Lakes all the way to the mouth of the river, um, they have, they have multitudes of different cultures and natures, uh, nations and languages. And with Christianity, you know, comes in contact with them, they express those things in certain type of ways. And so that's just, again, talking about that Nile Valley. I like the way uh, Dr. Professor Salim Faraji said it, the Nile, the, the Sahelic and the Nile Valley Christian, Sahelic being that area basically uh, between Sub-Saharan Africa and above the Sahara Africa. Uh, and then Nile Valley, of course, um, we, we know all about the Nile Valley civilizations because those being the two, you know, ancient Christian uh, areas. Uh, and so, yeah, you you get different expressions, languages, stuff like that, uh, all going down. But again, I want to just tell my, you know, my brothers and sisters in the faith that when you see something from Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism, because again, you can go in, or you can go and look at the Coptic Church and Ethiopian Church today and just see it. But just know that even when you see things in Roman Catholicism, uh, Anglicanism, some Lutherans, Methodist, high church, stuff like that, a lot of that stuff, not everything, again, not everything, but a lot of that stuff actually have has its expressional roots in Africa. And we already know from a theological basis standpoint, Africans, I mean, I don't really how you can get, especially Western Christianity without Africans. Um, just from a theological bedrock standpoint and what they did, it, it's, 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 you would have a very different understanding of Western Christianity without them today. And, and that's, that's a, a powerful uh, analysis because it's almost like they say it's nothing new under the sun. And black people, African people have perpetuated culture since like even when we look at America, like any everything we say, everything we do, it, it perpetuates the culture of this country. Mm -hmm. Like even the term woke. We 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 created that term to describe a particular section of our community, be it conscious or Christianity, etc. It's been co-opted by the wider country to mean something that we never intended it to mean. <laughs> the, the, the term hater or player hater, it's, it's evolved into something that, that's out, it, it's, it encompasses anybody that's, that, that hates on or, or you know, that type. Mm -hmm. we, we created the term. Um, and so, we we perpetuate culture, period. And and when when we look back at at the Roman Catholic Church and how it took those African concepts, be it dress, be it symbology, and other uh, aspects, it just shows you we've always done this, and we continue to do. It. Like nothing has changed. Right. And, and so I I just, I just dig that from that from that standpoint because people act like like this stuff is new and it's what we've done from the real and p here, here, here's a couple of things i want to add to what you just said um people need to know this there were four african hear me when i say this african popes in the first thousand years of uh the roman church because i don't want to say roman catholic church because that doesn't come around till 10 
post 1054 officially, but there were at least four African popes. So that lets you, so we talk about African pope, which just means leader, bishop, leader of the of that sect. Um, so you don't think they brought their Africanness uh, with them when you talk about people like a like a, an Augustine or a Tertullian and the Cyprian who were Africans. You don't think they brought those expressions with them in intersexuality, even within the Anglican tradition. And I want people to look this up. Look up the, the brother's name is Hadrian of Canterbury or Adrian of Canterbury. He's a North African in which the Bishop of Rome got him, who he wanted to actually be the Bishop of Canterbury. So you would have had, a, you would have had an African in the 600s been the Bishop over what came to be the Anglican church. Um, he set up theological schools all throughout the British Isles for that reason, teaching them the faith, traditions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so uh, we got Lutherans who are, uh, they, they, they had to basically, for lack of better word, make sure they get, G, get their stuff G-checked correctly with the Ethiopian church. Martin Luther had to do, he, he did that. He had to, he looked at the Ethiopian church as the light of what pure um, expressions of the faith would look like. And so you can't really escape, even in Western European traditions, uh, an African bedrock, whether it be a theological expression. And so uh, the, the issue for me with that is not to say they stole it, because I think that's when we go for like, oh, they just, no, stealing was not in that, that, that way. It was, it was a sharing of ideas, sharing of expression. What happened is, for lack of a better term, things are whitewashed. You don't know the history behind certain things. So when you don't know it, you assume by default it's 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 European. So you assume that it has nothing to do with you, but that could be nowhere from the point. And it is shocking, you know, when our and our sisters, brothers and sisters get you know get hit with it. They're like, oh man, were well, you trying to get this Africanness and you trying to make me into this committed? Criticism, uh, Christian, like, no, man, what I'm just trying to tell you, like, there's a history of how things develop. It's not saying that you, I'm telling you, put Jesus away. It's not, it has nothing to do with that, but it's, it's trying to show you that everything has a history and everything has a path on how it got here. And for so long, we have been just told how bad Africa is. And the only place that was not, only place, I would say two places, the only places that are not, Black African or brown African are Egypt, and for lack of a better term, Carthage, North African areas, you know. And so as much clowning as, you know, our, our brothers give us about the white Jesus, everybody forgets about that, uh, uh, the white pharaohs or the Charleston Hestons, uh, uh, when he played, Mo when him playing Moses, they forgot the pharaoh was white too uh, in that same, in that same movie. Um, you know, we, we forget about all when they, when they draw up to Trulians, Shenudas, uh, Athanasius, uh, Origins, uh, Augustine, Cyprian, um, they take away their Africanness away and they look more European. So again, it, 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 it happens. It, it has happened. And that's, that's upon us, whether you're in the faith or not, to make sure that you, we have to correct that, uh, for our people and, you know, for, uh, for broader people too, because, it's, it's real interesting that, you know, from a redneck, uh, white racist redneck who claimed to love the Trinity, you know, in Christianity, you tell them, well, you know, you know, it was a, it was an African that, that came up, came up with that term, you know, so, you know, it's interesting, like, all of a sudden, we, we, we porch monkeys for, for so long, but yet your same faith that you pray for, or pray to, or pray with an African, a black man came up with that whole terminology. And actually, when you look at it, a, a lot of the bedrock on your whole theology came from an African man. But yet, you know, you have no problem hanging us at the church services. That the, the hypocrisy and the dichotomy is so interesting. And again, that's on that's that's onus upon all of us. We gotta make sure not only educating our people, but we educating the public. But you know, bringing it full back circle, um those 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 expressions when you look at how they use the cultural underpinnings to express certain er certain things theologically the Coptic church they took a a a a, 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 a 
a magical hymn, whatever you want to call it, that was pre-Christian, right? And that same type of beat, and all it is in the Christian area, they, they inserted different terms to express a Christian or, 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 or triune God understanding. But it's it's the same, it's the same, you know, basis beat. You know what I'm saying? It's the same, it's, it's even the same word placement. It's like taking a song today, whatever, you know, throw a song out there, you know the song as soon as you hear it. You know, automate uh Frank and Frank and Bevan, love and happy, look uh, uh love and happiness, right? Dun, 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 dun. So imagine that we all know exactly what happens. You know the words to the song, you know the steps to as soon as it come on. Now imagine that. That's our cultural norm. We're taking everything about that, just changing the wording up to express something differently, but it's still culturally yours. Your people came up with the tone. You still get the same feeling. That's what the Coptic Church did. And that's what a lot of people, a lot of those ancient African churches did. And so that's something that we gotta, we gotta have an understanding of when, you know, a lot of times we look at things and just try to dismiss it and say, oh, they're trying to Africanize Kemeticism <laughs> and stuff like that. Cause I, I've heard that before. Oh, y'all trying to Africanize. Uh, uh, no, not African, not medicine, Christianized Kemeticism. Let me, let me, I said that wrong. Not African. That's a, that's a double entendre. No, Christianized Kemeticism. And I'm like, that's interesting. Um, you know, but, um, you know, even, even us moving forward, the Nubian church, because I mean, you, there's a ton of material out there for the Coptic church, because I'm Captain Form, but they still in existence. The Nubian church, for example, we are now getting more and more information. Shout out to Professor Dr. Salim Faraji because he wrote the uh, the, uh, the the last, it's new in Christianity, but I forgot it's like the last Pharaoh or something like that. Um, and he really goes into the history of Nubians relate Nubia's relationship with Kemet. And P, I know you all you all know about the how they how the Nubians had to come in and and, and, and clean some stuff up in Kemet. When things kind of got out of hand, and that love, and they had a love hate relationship. My, my, my namesake, Pianchi, in the twenty fifth dynasty, it actually it was his father, Costa, mm -hmm. who, who came up with it. Like, look, we got to go redeem our sister city, and this goes to Byron's earlier point about Nubia not being one country, but a bunch of countries within a country, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people will point out that. Uh, one uh, Nasu or Pharaoh would say something derogatory about Kushites or Nubians. Uh, I think Vocab said it to try to make it seem as if Kemet was evil. I had a negative outlook on all Kushites or Nubians, right? But he forgot to mention, and I think I, I mentioned it to him, that there were Nubians who fought in the Kemetic army because all Nubians did not were not the same or united under one banner, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so for those who were feuding with Kemet, for every everyone that was feuding with Kemet, there were others who were united with. And so Kashta said as as Kemet was under siege by foreign rulers and, and wars amongst the indigenous rulers. So you had upper and lower Kemet, you got foreign rulers squabbling over one section and uh, indigenous rulers squabbling and instability over the other section. And he said, you know what? We need to go redeem our uh, sister, sister nation, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And he took it as a sacred task to Amun to do so. He died before he could complete the task. And so Pianchi took it upon himself to complete it, did so, left his brother uh, Shabaka in charge as he went back to uh, Kerma mm -hmm. and ruled from there. And of course, we know the story uh, Shabaka became the ruler after he passed. When he passed, he passed it on to Pianchi's son, to Harker. So Harker is mentioned in the Bible as the king of Egypt and all the world. So this, this is our heritage. Mm -hmm. so, that people hate to 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 uh, acknowledge or don't want you to sort of relate to because they want you to believe that your heritage started on a plantation. <laughs> no, that's not it. 
they they would even say, why did you skip over West Africa and go over to Northeast Africa? Because I'm African. And, and at the, the practice of Sankofa does not limit, limit me to one coast, period. And, and to add into that with you is that skipping over, you know, we got to acknowledge that Christianity, whether we like it or not, was involved in the process of where we are today, our people's belief in Christianity. So it, it should be important to us to know that foundational principle, as you just laid out, all the way to your namesake, to Taharka and his relationship, biblically speaking, as I said earlier, outside the exit, and the exit, exit narrative, you don't really see this clashing like that uh, between the Israelites and 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 uh, Nubians and, and Kemetics. And the reason why I say, the reason why that's important because that's how we get to the New Testament to build up through the Old Testament. And so when Nubians get the faith, they're not, we, we say all that to go full circle. They're not shocked when they hear this narrative. They know, they, they, they know, they know their own history, first of all, <laughs> better than we know their history. They know their own history. They know their past. They know the people who, they, who they've rocked with and they understood these things. And so when the Nubians, and I say that loosely colloqu colloquially, but, um, uh, or collectively, I should say, um, the Nubians, that we are still trying to learn the expressions because as you you know three of us alluded to before there's a big bad um people that 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 fly under the the, the a crescent crescent moon and the star that has destroyed and are blocked a lot of potential excavations um particularly in the Sudan uh, to find out that history. And for me, that's this is a disservice because look, Christian or not, you still would want to know. These are African peoples. Like, I want to know what they were doing during the medieval times. And Dr. Farage, what I love what he did, like, he really, those digs now are showing how during the medieval era. Because, you know, we all are, are exposed to like European medievalism and stuff like that on TV shows. But to show that during that, when they were during their ages, Dark Ages or whatever the case is, you had Nubia thriving, Medi medieval you thriving. I'm talking about that's where you get the legends of the you know the brothers with the bows that will block out the sun and that you see in 300. You know that stuff that you see in 300 that actually is coming from the Nubian. The Nubian right. just were, were doing that. They just took they, they people don't know that for y'all listeners when you see 300 and they and they shooting no arrows and, and look like it's blocking out the sun that imagery comes from the story of how good the nubians were they were so good that they would shoot out your eye that wouldn't the persian concept that was from nubia as the brother just said and the book that the brother talking about is called the roots of nubian christianity of oh, yeah. the triumph of the last pharaoh and so uh, Y'all check that out. It's on Amazon. I just ordered it because I love this stuff. So, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely um, something that we we definitely have to examine. And I, and I'm not saying that because I'm I'm not a Christian, but I think it's important that we put some respect on all of our ancestors' names, regardless of what it was they followed spiritually, because they all had reasons for doing what they did, but we got to put respect on their names for what they contributed to our history, period. And so I think that this topic is, is important, just as important as the 3,000 years of comedic history mm -hmm. uh, and, and beyond. So all of our history is important. It all fits into that, that pie of African history uh, in continental African history and African history within the dysphoria. But go ahead, bro. No, no, you're good. When, when I talked to Dr. Farage, um, one of the things that he says is important why Nubian is, uh, history is important, Nubian Christian history is so important, is because their expressions would have been more, and not, that, not to say Coptic weren't, let me go ahead and say that, and not to say Coptic did not continue ancient comedic practices. But since during that time, they were closer to Greece, Rome, Persia, et cetera, et cetera. So as you know, 
the 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 as we joke, we often joking. There's a difference between ancient Kemet and Egypt. You know, I just say that. Um, so, but when you get to Nubia and you get further south, well, they you know the Greeks didn't necessarily go that far down. Neither did the Persians. Not to say they didn't try, and they weren't some attempts, but they didn't go as far south. So when you talk about Ethiopia, um, the Sudans today, he says it's so important because you really get to see. Um, e expressions of Nubian traditional spiritual systems, even through the lenses of Christianity. And when you talk about things like magical funerary texts, and I was like, magical funerary texts in the 11th century for a bishop? He said, yeah, because, you know, we, we, we hear magic and we think, you know, Harry Potter, blah, 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 blah. He's like, no, it's just saying, you know, it's like prayers. You know, as he transitions to so and so, so and so, and he broke this down to me. If you go to a headstone, a headstone today, and we put in, you know, here lies so and so, born and deaf, and we often we put it like a Bible phrase, or we may put something, you know, real uh, nice on the headstone. It's not. We don't think of it as magic. What we're doing is just our kind of honoring and you're saying like, look, you know, we want to say some good words for this person, what they meant and this, that, and the third. So when he broke that down to me, I was like, wow, I never understood it from that way because it's never been presented that way to us. And so um, the, Nubian, the, the Nubian history is so important because you really get a glimpse of just how those people worshiped, um, how did they understand uh, their religiosity, their spiritual systems. Um, you get, you know, you get, you get another, uh, sub-Saharan tradition along with the e Ethiopian, uh, church that got receipts. And it's important as West Africans, because the ma materials that we have today, um, and I got one of the books is called the, uh, tropical, the Catholic church in tropical Africa from 1492 to 17 something. Um, it talks about how in Benin, or, uh, uh, or the Benin Empire. Let me say, not, not Benin, the country today, the Benin Empire, which is Niger which is part of Nigeria. You had the Coptic Nubians interacting there and setting up uh, Christian uh, sites. And they, they even got a picture of some, some, some inscriptions of like, dude look just like a West African with a cross. Shirt off, got the head rack on, all that kind of stuff. I shared on my Facebook, some of the stuff that they got from the excavation, you see mass shells, stuff like that, all up in it within this Christian uh, burial site, which showing that they're taking, again, their native Africanness that they've always done, they never changed. And they're using this spiritual tradition that, they, that, that some have, ex have accepted as truth in Christianity and expressing it out through that. So even for that, even just from an intellectual standpoint, you should, any person of African descent we should want to know that because we're uncovering a piece of our past that we had no clue about. We don't know much about uh, uh, Nubian history during the Middle Ages because a lot of that stuff, again, is, was either destroyed by Islamic conquerors or it's buried and they don't, they don't allow excavations. Me and Point Blank Series, unless you go to like South Sudan as a Christian state, but Sudan proper, which is probably where most of the stuff is, you can't do excavations to find out what was going on. Um, you know, and so when you get like gems like that, it's important for all of us to hop on it. And again, as you said, people who freely, freely, no influencing, no sword, no, I'm a, if I give you this, I'm gonna pay your family off this. No, freely, chose to go this route and not only that you know anything about the Nubian history them suckers was bad I'm talking about when 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 even when uh Roman Catholicism tried to go to Nubia Nubians wasn't happening when when the Arabs tried to come to Nubia for a long time so much they had to have a truce they had to have a truce in play until eventually it would just became overwhelming and that's when you saw the fall of, of, of the Nubian empires proper into what you see more Islamic states today but I'm talking about, you know, the areas we know today is Chad, Sudan, South Sudan, like them brothers and sisters was not to be messed with cross or no cross. Right. Don't, don't, don't cross it on We got our own thing. 
And so with the sad thing that happened with Nubia is, and this is some kind of in, in intertwines within Christianity, when they were battling with uh, Islam, one of the bishops was killed. Um, and so they actually sent a petition out to the Ethiopian church for a bishop. But the Ethiopian church at that time was still under the Coptic church and the Coptic church was under Arabic rule. And so in, the, in, in essence, the Ethiopian church couldn't send them a bishop. The Coptic church couldn't send them a bishop. And during that time, the bishop was the leader of your Christian community. So they had no way of like being able to continue authentically, um, sacramentally uh, within those uh, traditions, uh, uh, their church. And that also, again, helped fall. And, and, and there's the, da the dam that they built in the 1960s. I can't think the name of it, but it flooded a lot of Anubia uh, because of that dam. And uh, I think it was the uh, it's the Aswan Dam. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And, and I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought it up because it it that that flooding bring brought up some discoveries that had long been uh, denied and rejected mm -hmm. by the wider Egyptologist community. Because you had a racist uh, notion that Egypt, although in Africa, was not an African nation. You even have some of our brothers and sisters who still say uh, Egypt was established by uh, Mesopotamians, and that Norma is uh, was Nimrod, the the biblical Nimrod. Mm -hmm. And so what that what the flooding of Nubia did, it uncovered uh, in the Aswan Valley and particularly the site known as Kusta. Mm -hmm. And what we did found out due, due to that excavation was that Nubia had the oldest monarchy in the world. Yep. And that the iconography that we know to be comedic iconography. The, the Haru Falcon, uh, Aset, uh, Asar, Ma'at, these different uh, characters that we would come to know from a, um, on a much wider degree from the comedic standpoint yep. had their origin in Nubia. And, and so Dr. Bruce Williams at Oriental Institute, Dr. Emily Teeter, uh, and Dr. Ken Keith Steele, all surmised from this dig that many uh, who was on the king's list as the first Nasu or pharaoh of Kemi is also Norma who uh, trekked up the Hapi and conquered the two lands, Smatawi as they called it, which mm -hmm. was upper and lower Kemi. And so Kemi comes out of Nubia. And so it makes sense that you would, as the doctor who you spoke with, who wrote this, this powerful book, said you got a, a, a more pure sort of uh, expression coming out of Nubia than you would coming out of Kemi. That was always the case, if you would, if you will, because that was the birthplace of it. Right. Be, be it comedic spirituality, Christianity, or whatever, because this is this was the original birthplace of that particular expression of civilization. I just wanted to say that because it, at talking about the flood of, of the Aswan Dam and all of that, and, and what was uncovered with the coastal site and the coastal incense burner and all of the different tools, <laughs> we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Kemet is a continental indigenous African culture that came out of Nubia, moved up to Hapi, et cetera. But go ahead, bro. No, no, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a, I, I, no, no, no qualms there. And so I just think it's, it's important for us because, you know, from a Christian standpoint, especially in America, um, we, we are not being honest. We're not a used to identifying African expressions, period. We have African expression, expressions in our things we do, but we, we don't have the best way of identifying it to say that's African. 
and especially especially on the eastern side of Africa. And so when you see, you know, the way they were worshiping and stuff like that, and I was talking to my pastor about this a couple of days ago, um, and he's even kind of reevaluating some stuff. He's like, well, man, that's crazy because we've been so taught that certain things are European um, in expression and how, you know, Protestantism and stuff like that, like that's the way we should do things and ABCD. And a case can be made that actually, and this is going again, shocks of my brothers and sisters, the expressions of say the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, even the Syrian Church are actually much more closer to ancient African Christian, all the way up through the, the mid centuries expressions, then what we get from the Reformation and post-Reformational period that the quote unquote black church inherits later. And so then that puts us on, I mean, I, I, I'm feeling free so I can jump off the, jump off the, uh, jump off the ledge. It puts us on a question. The original question, is Christianity the, the white man's religion? Then you have to ask, well, maybe Christianity isn't the white man's religion. Maybe the next question is, are the expressions that we have in America particularly, are they the white man's expressions in black folks? You see, because now, and again, these are conversations that I have with Christians all the time, so it's not Hey, don't it, it don't it ain't gonna shake my faith when it comes to you know what I believe. You see my cross on right now, but you also see this buy black shirt on too. So you know buy black. Um, now it puts us the kind, in my opinion, the conscious community been been focusing on and asking the wrong question. See, they've been focused on the past four or five years of hammering out a Christianity is a white man's religion, stolen from Kemet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's not the question. You can actually pick up an easy history book and debunk that question uh, one on one easily. Global Christianity, we actually, Wikipedia can do can do it for you. It's it's pretty simple laid out. The better question would be: Is your expression a African or indigenous expression, or are you doing a black expression of a European response? And so those questions are tougher because now if you say, you know, if you say you're Baptist, right? Well, Baptist is started by John Knox and John Smith, two Europeans who are responding against the Roman Catholic Church. Okay. But the things that they're responding to or reject don't have their beginnings or theological foundation in Rome. They actually theological found, found it in Africa. So if I'm say black Baptist and I'm reject, would I reject the Coptic church? Would I reject the Ethiopian church? If the, Nub if the Nubian church was today, would I reject that church? Would I reject the North African church because it looks Roman? Because then you got a lot of, it looks Roman. Well, Roman looks African, right? And so again, these are these are questions. These are I'm not giving answers or anything like that, but these are questions that we have to wrestle with today because again, our forebears they didn't they didn't have this information. I'm not I'm not I'm not faulting our forebears, uh, you know, who were black, you know, our MLKs, our uh, CH Masons, and you know, people uh, uh, African Methodist, Methodist uh, Richard. I'm not I'm not faulting them. For that, because they did, they, 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 you had to go with what you had to go with. But now, as we are growing and understanding cultural expressions, especially today amongst even the Christian community, in this battle along racial and cultural lines, to where, you know, anything, you know, you, man, they, it would be for so long, black expressions would be seen as as abhorrent or wrong you know y'all shouting why the, why the preacher shout y'all saying amen you ain't supposed to do that what's this praise break dancing not understanding that has its origins in ring shout in west africa um 
you know, all these other different, you know, all these other different things. But to the broader Christian world, again, in America, those things were looked at as negative or wrong. We need to get that out. They, we need to get that out of them. And some of our people responded by almost being more European Christian than Europeans. I was just about to ask you, bro, <laughs> because if you look at any video, old or new, of a, of a Vodun or Ifa, a Risha ceremony around the fire, and you see the woman dancing, I got a woman that's near and dear to my heart. Rest in power, Sister Ruth Miller. Every time she saw me, she said, my mighty man of valor. And <laughs> love her, love her. It was like I had a second grandma. And when she, she'll do a, 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 what she called a belly yell, and she'll start, start moving them feet, you could take her and move that sister out of that Ifa ceremony or that Vodun ceremony and put her in it. And nothing would change. That changes. Because again, we perpetuate these cultures. And so I always thought about that as I started to come into particular knowledges about African spiritual concepts versus Christianity. Like, is anybody, am I the only one seeing this? So <laughs> elaborate on that a little bit, because I think as we've been poisoned against African spiritual concepts, and what they truly meant versus what we told they mean, that's got sort of uh, lost in translation or lost in the sauce, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I got to go pay a water bill, so just keep building. And I, no, you good. Right. But, but, but yeah, break that down, if you will. So so what we have to do is, is, is recognize a couple things. Um, we don't have a we did not have a West African tradition in Christianity that we could see and view um, that was native prior to the slave trade proper. And again, I'm not saying that Cong Congolese Christianity wasn't because it definitely was, but as a whole, you know, with Congo, Congo is still in central. We, we don't really have a way to to look back at it because there was a disruption to where the Congolese Christianity that happened during the 6th, 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, that was cut off eventually by the Roman Catholic Church and during slavery. And so the, the, the Catholic Christianity that you see today is a little different than the native. So we look at our African expressions today in Coptic um, and the uh, Ethiopian. Well, um, as we know, at purely, d definitely African, but on the continent, there's a multitude of different African expressions and African cultures. So a lot of times we don't even connect to those expressions culturally because there was, you know, Ethiopians don't operate culturally, even without Christianity, don't operate culturally the same way that a, a Ghanaian will or a Nigerian will. It's just, it, it's, it's just simple. It's not wrong or right. It's just a simple fact. The reason why the Nubian expression was so important because Nubians were far closer to West Africans than the other two. And their expressions would have been more akin to what we would assume a untouched African Christian expression, West African in particular Christian expression would be. And also the North African church as well as the Berbers are traveling down through the Sahel into like the Mali Empire, which had Christians in there from the Sahil in their empire as well. You, we, we don't we don't have a chance to actually see those expressions to, to do a compare and contrast. So what we see today is, you know, voodoo, ifa, things of that nature, in our in our previews, and we don't get to see how does an uh, how does a, a ancient West African Christian tradition look to see how we compare and contrast? We kind of make it up as we go. In fact, a lot of scholars would say the only West African authentic expression of Christianity would be the black church. 
in, in, in this expression, not theology, not, not practices, but in this expression, because we, we kept a lot of things, just kept it culturally. Um, and so you're right. You can't, I mean, look, I'm from, I'm, I'm from South Louisiana, man. And, and, and bro, the, the, the spiritualist, as we call it, you go to a spiritualist, you go to a voodoo session, you go to a Pentecostal church, you can go to a Baptist church at this point, and me, you're going to see similar behaviors cut up all the way around. So we, we kept a lot of those things, but we just don't have a, a longstanding uh, tradition. And so then it begs the question to say, man, you know what? How can I get back to culturally? And it's not to say that Europeans' culture are, is inherently wrong. Everybody has a culture. Everybody has a, has a background. But as me and my pastor, we were talking about it, and he said it like this. You know, in Europe, during the Reformation, you had Europeans had the chance to evaluate history and reject certain things with Roman Catholicism. But when you talk about Africans, West Africans in particular, and indigenous people, we never had the opportunity to accept or reject these other ancient traditions. We were just given and says, this is right. So the example we gave is like, you know, if you go to Europe, Europe still got Roman Catholicism right now. It still has Eastern Orthodoxy, it still has Anglican, Anglicanism, Lutherism, et cetera. Still has it. And then you have those who aren't those in those traditions that are reformed and, uh, and different expressions and stuff like that. But as, as, as African peoples, West Africans in particular, we've never had the opportunity to say we got an a ancient tradition from the Nubians or the North Africans or the Coptics or the Ethiopians to take that and access to see if we're going to keep it are we going to reform or, or or do whatever we do whatever we do you know against it or towards it and so that that is the key point to say we haven't even had the we have not even had the opportunity to properly assess to reject or accept those ancient traditions in the way that our european counterparts are because we were brought up having to be methodist or baptist or pentecostal but we were never given the faith traditions of the Nubians or the Ethiopians or the Copts or the North Africans who predate those aforementioned names that I said by 1500 years. So again, these are all questions that we had to assess because as we look at our expressions, we've done a hard time uh, condemning Ifa, voodoo, all this stuff as, as devil worship, right? But not accessing to see from a critical eye to say, are these, these traditions trying to express a natural cultural expression of a faith, even though they disagree on, on who Jesus is and what he and how he operates and who God is and stuff like that. The expressions, as you pointed out, the expressions are African. So we we still would have to assess to see like let's 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 still these still our brothers and sisters coming from the same people groups because we find it's interesting we would we are okay with sitting in pews in a staple church in a steeple church right sitting in pews and stuff like that have a choir behind the preacher you know all drum drums and music to the side or whatever that's normative for us. But to see a fire and people dancing around the fire and say people reading their Bible and shouting and dancing and clapping hands, we, 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 we pause a little bit, not understanding that both of those two subjects are expressions of the culture in which they come from. Because pews in a steeple church or what we call a steeple church today and that set up, that is not, that is pre-Christian in Europe. They were doing that regardless. And they took that and they European as they should and European and, and, and Christianized it and, and made it as such. I have no issue with that. But don't tell me that the hush harbors that my ancestors went through when they would all gather around in circle and light a fire, and you would have one person with his Bible, sometimes not even his Bible, just exhorting what they got from the creator um, and having these dances and expressions. 
Don't tell me that that's inherently evil or telling our indigenous brothers and sisters that they can't have Christian sweat lodges or Christian totem poles expressing their culture, right? And telling them that they got to do it this kind of way. And I see, and I'm starting to see that a little bit amongst African Americans in particular, a way to say, well, don't do that stuff and don't do that stuff, but not seeing the European influences in the stuff that we have. And I'm like, do we need to take some step back? Not saying that we're taking away our faith, take some steps back and assess our culture, accept, accept, access the history of the faith in Africa and the ancient traditions that are in Africa. And look at those as the motherships per se, to see what things can we do today that we, uh, that would give us more crudence culturally. Because what I found, bro, and being frank, is that ever since black people have been, been expressing Christianity on this continent, they have always get gotten strife from their European white counterparts in the faith. And not saying all of them, definitely not saying all. And I wonder, because in Africa, they don't have that concept. Not not West Africa, I'm talking about the, the in 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 East in, in Ethiopia and Cop, they don't have this concept of a white man's religion or European religion. Because they're like, we stand tall long before them. We got our own stuff. And even if you tell them, well, you know, some of the European people don't agree with the way you express it. No. And okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. You know, and so I I ponder that to say, you know, maybe we need to take a play and get me, me thinking, take a take a, a a play out of that playbook to say, you know what, let's look at our stuff to see if we can African Christianize the black church. And I just coined that phrase here. So don't everybody don't if you're gonna steal it, at least, at least give your boss a credit. African Christianize the black church, meaning that. Let's take the black church and it's all history and expressions. And let's go further back and evaluate it with the ancient African traditions so we can have something that's more palatable to us. Because we do it in, we do it in everything else. We do it in our clothes. We do it in our food. We do it even in our languages. But when it comes to our faith traditions, it's like, well, no, you know, don't don't you go don't go past the Reformation now. You won't get into that 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 devil worship stuff. And it's just like you know, you don't you don't have to be Roman Catholic to be an ancient Christian. And I think we have to learn that, like, I don't have to be Roman. I, I can be, you know, there's a- ancient African practices, and some things you may or may not agree agree with, but assess them. Let's look at them through the lens and see what they mean when they say certain things, and what's the innovation and what's not. Uh, and so that's why I say, man, I, I'm a fan of African Christianity because of because of this, because it's like you it's almost like you read you learning African history and you I'm still, you know, in my faith tradition, me personally. But you're learning something. Just how native African people express this faith and didn't have to put aside their Africanness to do it. They, they didn't have to acquiesce to someone else's culture to believe what it was they decided to believe. That's and that's why I've, I've gotten to a point where I'm going to do what I do and I'm going to believe what I believe and, not, and, and I'm not going to believe what I don't believe. But as it pertains to our people, and this is why I've been saying this at the beginning of all my shows, we can disagree without being disrespectfully disagreeable and our different ideologies shouldn't keep us from uniting and we can have unity without uniformity because if you are for your people believe whatever you want to believe we can we can sort that out amongst ourselves Mm -hmm. however we decide to as long as we respect one another but at the end of the day we have to give each other the latitude and the respect to say they have the intelligence and the ability to process whatever it was they needed to, to still have that belief or to discard 
that belief and and move on and still be brothers and sisters. I I I gave I like Cap touch touched my heart the other day. My my mother going through what she's going through. Mm -hmm. And I hit the brother up, let him know he was gonna have to postpone some of our conversation. And he was like, you know, send me back a heartfelt message and you know, hey, if you need anything, bro, you know, I got you. And I'm like, like I don't at that at that moment he could care less about I study comedic spirituality and I could care less about him being an Israelite. We two black men and he saw. Uh, he had a concern for me as a brother mm -hmm. and expressed his support, period. Our belief was irrelevant. Or our belief informed that concern. Yes. You, you, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so, so, so at this point, I could care less what another Black person believe as long as they love Black people and support Black people. Not in foolishness, but in righteousness. Right, right. And so, and, and so it, 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 that, that, that's that's where I'm at with it, man. And so I, I think that that you bring you, you we kind of touched on something that that's interesting, though, because as a people in this particular country, we have uh, like a shame or a disdain for being African to the point that you have people going out of their way to not not <laughs> ignore their African identity. Uh they they, you know, I, I just mentioned my brother Cap. And that that's my that's my brother, that's my captain. But he says he's an Israelite. He's not African. We got other brothers and sisters. I have a uh you know distant family members, uh, you know, they uh they more akin to uh my brother Shabaka, but they say that they're Native Americans. They're not Africans. And so we have these identity issues that I think are equal parts shame for some of the messages and, and images that we get from the continent. And then, you know, we being told that these, these spiritual concepts are evil. We being told that uh, we shouldn't want to have anything to do with this place, and then, you know, at the same time, you know, again, we another one, we Moors, or we we are the tribe of Shabazz out of one part of the world, but we went into Africa, so we got all of these different different <sighs> these, these different stories and origins of why we not African, but we ended up in Africa. Uh, we, you know, the slave trade went in reverse. We was taken from here and put over in Africa. <laughs> All of these different things because we so ashamed of Africa. And again, these African spiritual concepts and cultures are evil. Why is it, from 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 what you've been able to ascertain, what is it about being African, and and these African concepts, be it spiritual or otherwise, that has a lot of our people wanting to disassociate themselves from the continent. Because, because again, we got we got I named some people who just come up with totally different identities, but we also have brothers and sisters who they acknowledge that they are of African descent, but they have no interest whatsoever in anything in Africa beyond just saying, yeah, I know my people got taken from Africa, but that's it. Like, what is it about the continent, about the, the concept of being African that has our people so vexed in that way? It's, 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 uh, the easiest way is white supremacy. Because if you can take a people from a land, right, and you have to make them fit. You can't just tell them that they come from nothing, but you have to only show them and prove them that they come from nothing. And then to affirm that they come from nothing, you show them how in the 1800s, how all these, the Berlin Conference, how all these people um, split up the continent. And now all these Africans are speaking 
French and Portuguese and Spanish and English and ah, blase, blase. And so you belittle the mind of an African. And then when that comes into it, uh, you know, you strip your identity. You don't know which tribe, nation that you came from. Um, then you, you know, there's the other part, like, you know, there's, there, then the, on the native side, they've only portrayed native Americans to look one certain kind of way, which is always odd to me. I'm like, you're talking about North and South America with a multitude of ethnicities, but every on, the only people are only just quote unquote red? Like, that don't, that don't even make sense, right? You're gonna have darker Native Americans, you're gonna have cold black, you're gonna have pale skin, like, like it, people, people, and we, we had this discussion, you're talking about ranging from, the, from geography and all that. But nonetheless, I think it's, it, it, it's a shaming of Africa. And you were told that you were the savages. You were told that you were ungodly, that you did child sacrifice and all this stuff like that. And some things may be true because we're talking about a continent, not a country. But what's interesting is that when we pull the layers back of what's going on, what's going on, what's happening in Europe. That's why I always love like reading European history. I'm like, that's a lot of that's a lot of pot called in the kettle black there. We talk about savagery. You talk about a lot of a lot of a lot of the pot calling the kettle white. <laughs> yeah, essentially, you know, you 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 call them like you you show to call people savages, man. Y'all witchcraft, like don't y'all dabble in do, doing all that kind of stuff and all these paganese and 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 stuff like that. But okay, okay. Um, but I think for us, let's like say you get on different scales. You get people that say they're not African, they're Hebrew, they're more than Native American. And then you get those who say, well, I'm African, but I ain't got nothing to do with them people, right? Like, you know, I'm gonna be, and I said it before, I'm gonna be more European than the European. You know, I'm gonna I'm I'm show y'all, you know, our brother Malcolm talked about it, but we still see it to this day. It's like, well, dang, brother, sister, you, you, you caping harder. Like, if we just get these lazy, childless, lazy black people and all these deadbeat daddies in the black community, it's like, oh, okay, we, so we just gonna ignore like all the stuff, the reason why. Again, it's not all black people, all black people, but uh, wh why we were put in this situation to begin with, even post-slavery, but we're just gonna ignore that like it ain't like it ain't nothing, right? You got black people today that's telling, you know, champion to not learn about critical race theory. That's A, a theory. And B, it only teaches you, they don't, one, they don't even know what critical race theory is, but it, try, it only teaches you the aspect of what truly happen in this country to disadvantage minority people and how it ain't it ain't all rose color It's the reason why black people celebrate their fourth of july different than their counterparts we don't be out here with american flags draped around and stuff like that we might have a little cookout get the family over get a couple of beers may cook some fireworks but that's about it you ain't gonna see us want you know putting the you know american flags on our stuff during july 4th there's a reason behind that it's a culture we still american but it's a culture behind that and, it, and it's a history but it's, it's the degradation of, of African stuff. And so we look at it, we always train to look at it with a side eye, like it's devilish, like it's like it's something wrong with it. But, you know, I was like, but, but when you peel back, all of this stuff comes from African people. You know, I just, we just finished a, a series about a couple weeks ago and I employ everybody to watch it called How and the Hog on Netflix, amazing series. It talks about the African and black um, origins of American cuisine. So I give a, you know, and I won't spoil it, but I'll give an example like this. We often hear the term uh, Southern cooking, right? But we know in true, it's soul food, which comes from us. And so they talked about like, for example, um, George Washington had a slave that was a world renowned chef. Um, but we don't have too much records of him anymore. Consequently, his wife, Martha Washington, has this infamous cookbook. Now, I ain't this, like our brother Berean say, I ain't the sharp, uh, sharpest knife in the drawer. But if you own a slave that's a world renowned chef, and I know you ain't in the kitchen cooking, 
Cause them ain't no, they ain't them, them them stoves not like our stoves. So they do you can get burned and be killed in those in those in those kitchens back in the day. And now you got this famous cookbook and all kind of stuff like that. It it made me cause a pause of thinking to all these people, especially me being from the South, white Southerners. Well, you know we got this great uh, uh, sugar cookies recipe that's been in my family for 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 centuries, and these tea cake recipes. And you look back like, well, hold on a second. Because the, the only people that I know that was consistently cooking, consistently in the kitchen, were people like me and you. So even the 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 the, the, the groundbreakingness of the food that we eat that we call American dishes, black people would do it. Catering companies, right? Well, who was who was catering these these large dinners for these plantation owners? Who was setting the place tables? Who was putting the forks in the right places and the spoons and making sure that everybody was served correctly, had the five course meals? Who was doing that? So we were talking about catering companies. It's like, man, well, hold on a second. Who, who had the knowledge? And I just say all this because we took these Africanists with us to this country. We express it in so many different things that we don't even recognize. Our language today, people joke about our double negatives. You know, I ain't got no, but when logistics experts look at it, it's using the English language, but it's from an African tongue because that's how we talk. If I tell, if you go tell your son to go take out the trash, he said, all right, it's done. I got it. And he may not do it until two hours later. But the way the Africans talk is that when you say, when I say it's done, it's in existence. The future and the past become uh, the future and the present become merged to the point to where, all right, daddy, I got it. Don't worry about it. It's done. It's handled. That means you don't even have to worry about it two or three hours later because my son already affirmed and put in existence that it's, again, that's an African, that's an African linguistic speak. The barbershop talk, when everybody be talking over each other, that's how we, we, we don't talk in this. Raise my hand, my turn, your turn. Right. That day I would communicate. And I'm oh. just saying that because we got to recognize the Africanness in our everyday things that we do. There you go. It's and one because, phrase. As I, I apologize for cutting you off because you yeah. just said something powerful. It's one phrase that I've probably told my wife a million times and I soon to be 24 years together. I told you I was going to do it. <laughs> because if I said yes, it's yes. <laughs> but I, man, anyway, go ahead, bro. I, I, I just had to throw that in there because I know she listened. It's 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 something funny like when somebody say, Man, I don't have money. Okay. I ain't got no money. Dang. I ain't never got no money. Those three phrases means something totally different. But in English language, those are like if you in 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 in, in, in if you take a, a grade level English class, you fail because that's not how you're supposed to put a sentence together. Right. But I just said something and added a couple words and you knew exactly from saying I ain't got no money, I ain't got money to I ain't got no money to I ain't never got no money. Those two three things mean something totally different. Right? And I'm just using that as a small example to show the Africanness and even the way we speak and communicate. This fear that this real fear of African, and even in, in shout out to our indigenous brothers and sisters too, because I don't want to leave them out the leave them out the frame, man. Out frame, because man, I just I say that because I just finished watching this HBO series called Kill the Kill Kill All the Brutes. Man, that, oof. Yeah, that's all I gotta say. Um, but we have to do better and understanding and, and extrapolating our culture and not seeing our culture is equal, right? Like we don't have to take a step back to, 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 to anyone to apologize. And I love that, you know, un unapologetically African, unapologetically black, whatever you want to call it, because you don't have to apologize for your culture to which you come up in and where you come from. And it, it comes down even to our spiritual traditions to where we don't even want to look at non-Christian African traditions in West Africa or even Christian traditions in Africa that we don't agree with. Because as I said with my pastor, as he said to me, and he said this straight up, he said, do I disagree with them? Because they're like, he was talking about like the Ethiopian church, full disclosure. He's like, 
do I disagree with them because they're wrong or because I, I, I have been inherently taught that they're wrong from someone else's perspective in history? And the reason he was saying is like, am I talking for myself who, who has looking looking at 2000 years of Christian history or am I looking at it from the lenses of the tradition of American Christianity, looking at them and saying their expressions and the way they believe certain stuff in ABCD are wrong. And it's a real, you know, and it's, and it's, again, that's, that's on the spiritual tip, but it's everything else. And so we get that, the results is we get the aspects of nobody wants to be, Af everybody want to be black, nobody want to be African. So, you know, nobody want to, I'm a Moor, I'm an Israelite. I'm a this and I'm a that. And I always tell people like, you know, you know, Moors were in Africa. So that, that still don't disqualify you from being African. Israelites, like Israelites are in Africa right now, still to this day. That don't disqualify you from being African. And even the term African as we you know, I know it, that's 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 a modern term. The people on the continent didn't call themselves that, and they didn't have no boundaries. So the, the, this idea of, of getting away from our culture and seeing it lesser than we have to do a better job collectively teaching our next generation black is beautiful great yes but also showing like you know africa is beautiful as well too intentionally showing them good images and then also and i and i and i'm planning to do this a few weeks telling the truth about the dominant culture's past too um telling them about their paganisms that they put into their TV shows and stuff. I just finished Loki series uh, that just ended, right? Man, listen. Like you put your, you, you, they have no problem putting their pre-Christian pagan stuff into normalized society. Harry Potter got like seven books and like eight, nine movies dealing with wizards and stuff like that. But we were told that voodoo priests were the devil. Come on. Right? Um, you That's know. When my son, got ready to write his, his stories. And he wanted a character that was a demigod or a god type character, i.e. Thor from Marvel. And he was gonna use Hercules. And I was like, son, that been done a thousand times. <laughs> Cause he big on not copying or, you know, uh, uh, infringing on what somebody else did. So I said, he was like, so what you think? I was like, do something African. And so he was like, you want me to do Haru? I said, no, you ain't got to do the roof. And so I told him about Shango. And, uh, yeah. and he was like, oh, man. So, you know, he got he got a story coming up where Shango is the focus and the Orishas are the supporting characters. And it's, it's similar uh, in, in the storytelling mode that, that Marvel did Thor or that DC did Wonder Woman. But, right. but, but it's different. And you know what I mean? And yeah. I think it's important for him to come from that aspect and to follow that same old truth. It, and, and I don't think there's nothing wrong with it. Right. And, and, and that's what we have to be able to assess because we've been told these same things in our cultures were so wrong and so evil. But yet, when we put Liz back, like, you, you have normalized European cultures, whether pagan or non-pagan, Christian or non-Christian, you normalize it to where we don't even look twice at it. And it's like, but everything from our stuff is wrong. Like, like what do you, and so now you gotta go back and wait, hold on a second. Let me, let me take some steps back and let's look at some stuff to see, you know, what's right, what's right and what's wrong. And then give us the, and we need to respect ourselves and give us respect to say, I can have cognizant distance. If, 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 if you can be a white man from Arkansas, and go see the newest Black Widow movie that just dropped, right? And Marvel, I Wonder Woman when that dropped. Take your kids, no problem, right? And that don't you don't have no issues on Sunday morning going to church. Then, with all due respect, when my people, when we do Black Panther, I don't need y'all assessing. And I seen Black people do, assessing. Uh, well, you know, we can't, we got to remember, we can't let these Africanisms mess with our spiritual. So I'm like, yeah, y'all did this for Black Panther, right? But y'all didn't have no problem when it was, when it was Superman with an alien being coming from Krypton, saving the world, right? 
But right. an African man with technology that, that's coming, like, well, you know, you can't let all them African, like, we got to stop that. Bro, come on, man. We we got to stop that because, because I can I can look at Black Panther, I can look at uh, 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 Asante, the uh, Ashanti, the, the spider, and look at those stories and not have my faith feel like it's infringed on because I understand that storytelling and what's that's going on, and I understand my faith here. They do it all the time, but it comes to us. We all of a sudden gotta like, we can't allow that in the in the in the community. And I'm like, think about it, bro. We are so spooked by our own culture. Because you you just hear something so powerful, man. Because Greek culture, that because that's the standard for for which they perpetuate their society, uh, Western civilization, etc. Right? That is Greek heroes are the standard by which all of their stories are told: Hercules, Perseus, Achilles, mm -hmm. all of these different things. Right? They have no shame. Beowulf. Uh, have, to read, have to read that in high school. <laughs> Thor, all of these things, they have no shame. They glorify in these things. Homer and the, the Iliad. Where these are blockbuster movies. And they, they've been adapted in comic books, in novels, American Gods. Uh, the, TV the, shows. The, yeah. I mean, it continues because they have no shame of it. They architecture, everything. They embrace it. Uh, like I said, they embrace Greek architecture, culture, storytelling, etc. They, they they honor the Iliad and the Odyssey. But you let us bring up the Per M Haru. What 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 are you talking about? You let us bring up the pyramid text, or um, like you said, Anasi. The the, the yeah, I don't know why I say something. You know, or a, a Zulu mythology, or the story of Ogun and Yamaya in the Orisha culture. Let, let us start talking about those things and see the faces that you will get, because we've been so poisoned against our own culture. Because I like the like the man said, the the definition of power is the ability. Oh, yeah. now, now this is this is a, a this is not the dictionary. Uh, uh, definition. So I want to make sure we clear on that for for my for my brothers who going who going to say that's not the. <laughs> <laughs> they going to Google you. They going to Google yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that's not the definition. So for for my brothers who going to say that's not the definition, I I I, I got you. But but I I want to make sure that that I'm I'm saying that from from the beginning. But. One example, let's 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 say it like that. One example of great power is one society or one civilization's ability to conquer and subjugate another society or or civilization and superimpose their culture, their social mores, folk ways, and and everything they are onto that civilization and culture and, and society while erasing their society and poisoning them against their own society. That's That's got to be one of the greatest examples of power that you have ever seen from a, from a physical standpoint, a psychological standpoint, and a spiritual standpoint. Like Native Americans, for everything that they've been through, they still, Christian or otherwise, they still embrace their culture and their history. Mexicans still embrace their culture. Like, they can be Christians. They still love the Aztecs. You, 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 you see what I'm saying? Like, you, we you are the only. Yeah, go ahead. Let me tell you, let me tell you how power works. <clears throat> what is the difference between a Native American, say a Choctaw, and the Mexican. Break it down. Nothing. Because Mexico is a country. It's a political estate. But those people groups have always been there, whether they're on the Mexico, Spanish rule, whatever. We create these borderlines to say who are you and who are not. So when we do these assessments and we say all these illegal 
illegal aliens. We're like, but these they, these are their native lands. Just because you you grew you drew a land between New Mexico and Mexico and Arizona and Texas and Mexico, these are still their native thousands of years communities. Right. And so when you do a U.S. census, when those people they are forced to check Mexican American. They don't check Native American. So in essence, what you just done for indigenous people, you have split them up to either be Native or Hispanic, Latino, Mexican. So that population is now split. So now you can say, well, it's not that many of them that y'all think. No, right. they're still here. Right. They do the same thing with us Absolutely. when it comes to African American, but let you speak Portuguese or Spanish you Latino, so you gotta pick that. You can't, you can't speak. But it's just like, wait. So you telling me my designation is based off of what European conqueror I had? Exactly. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly that, that, that's is. that's that, that's power. Power, bro. That, that is a power. And then now, they take your native histories, culture, and have demonized it to the point to where, like, bro, I'm in, I'm in Louisiana, so we do Mardi Gras. We do Mardi Gras, and it's always celebration. They do celebrations of Greco-Romans and got uh, Greek gods and stuff like that. But we do Africans when we do ours. So when we do Africans, people look at like, why y'all doing this? Why are you doing that? I'm like, but you have no problem with Ophesus, Zeus, all this other stuff. But when we do when we did our Mardi Gras, we did Crew of Oshun or Oshun, whatever you pronounce it. They look at it as crazy. Now, Shun is a water goddess in West Africa, and I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We got the Mississippi River. So that makes the most sense because the river has literally shaped our culture here. But now you're looking at us, white and black, looking at us side of what's going on. And you just you start to see the dichotomy. It's like, well, hold on a second now. You have normalized European culture. And I'm not, I don't have a let me say this, I don't have an issue in inherency with European culture because they should celebrate their own heritage and culture. But I'm saying I should be able to celebrate mine freely and be have held to the same standards as anyone else's. So if in high school I got to read Group Guys and Heroes, you know what? I want to read about the Orishas too. If if I got to read the Odysseus, uh, Odysseus and the Iliad, I want to re read about Patal Hotel. Let, let me learn about the first. Uh, the, the the first uh, architects in the in in uh, in the known world. Let me read. Let me. Why can't we learn about the oldest written text in the world? I ain't saying you got to agree with their spiritual traditions, cause but at the same time, I'm not sitting here worshiping Zeus and, 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 and Hercules neither. And I don't know many white people that are, but we still know every single thing about them. Exactly. We still get a movie every three years about them. Tell me when the next Patel Hotel movie. Exactly. When they, when they make a movie about the pair of him or, or when they give you a, 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 a movie, they give you the dude from uh from Game of Thrones. God, playing, God, playing, playing, and then throw you a bone and give you our brother Chad with, with may you rest in power. Throw throw him a bone. Oh well, we will give y'all one black one. Right, right. And Jamie Lannister playing Haru and the dude from Three Hundred playing Sutek. Like, <laughs> come on, man. Come on, like, okay, like come on, bro. Yeah. That's Come right. on, you know what? And I'm just like, y'all would never like, let me let, let Morgan Freeman have played. Let Morgan Freeman have played Zeus but, and see but, how y'all would act. But The Rock played Hercules, and it was like, wait a minute, that's oh, but but he he don't say he black, so it's okay. Like did that? Like people actually had to rationalize. Well, he 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 say he's Samoan, even though we know when we when we look at Samoans. And we hear some like we <laughs> to even say he black. His daddy is the right. All you got if you know wrestling, if you know wrestling, Rocky is Johnson is a black man. Yeah, yeah. The rock the the rock Dwayne Johnson and never denied his blackness, but he also affirmed his Simone, which I ain't got a problem with. I'm your mother and your father. But exactly. how they always say, well, he's not black, he's Simone. Exactly. Come on, man. Oh, oh, now you putting the qualifiers out. But then when my people in Louisiana and Mississippi got their land taken because they had a uh, 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 white people getting their land taken because they had a, a, a tenth of black, a hundredth of a black in them, they black. But now the rock, he's Simone. Exactly. And it's cool for him exactly. to play Hercules because he kind of, 
he kind of he kind of almost you know what I'm saying so these dichotomies I just say all that to say because I got to end up closing out as well I didn't realize we was rocking this long yeah but, I, I just looked at that myself <laughs> <laughs> you, um, you, called, you called it though before we I, went on you're right you're right but you know it's like bro your Africanness it's like, bro, you don't have to put that into a, uh, to my all brothers and sisters. You don't have to put that into your pocket. You don't have to apologize for it. You can walk in your truth in your whatever spiritual tradition that you have. I implore if you a black Christian to really look into African Christian any 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 any, any anybody personally because I think there's a lot of African history period that we don't acknowledge during that time frame. Either you have a bias against Christianity, period, and you don't want nothing to do with it, and you just discount the fact that these were Africans. And then if you are Afri- if you're a black Christian and you just unaware of a Christianity that's two thousand years old expressed on the continent, um, I think all those things are true, and that we need to uh, have a chance to investigate, to look at, to read more, and assess. Because I'm being on the podcast, and even as a Christian, I feel like this: if a lot of our brothers and sisters who are no longer in the faith or reject the faith were brought up from birth to, even if they weren't in those traditions, to know about them and to have that option and to really, really know about it, I don't think we would have some of those issues that we have today because a lot of people is just like, I can't, and this is true, I can't separate Christianity and Europeanism because I don't know any Africanisms without of Christianity. And even in the Africanism of Christianity, I know it's got European involvement. So I'm like, I don't want to do it. I think, I think personally, again, not everybody, if a lot of people I had that growing up, even me, I'm 30, going 33 in, the, in a few weeks. And I still would be like, man, I wish I knew about the Coptic church and the Ethiopian church and the Nubian churches so I could have a better grounding and be even more secure and not have to apologize for my Africanness and my Christianity and just be like, I ain't got to apologize for nothing because my people been rocking this for 2,000 years. My aunt, my hit, my aunt, my, my lineage and the history goes back to, as you just laid out easily, uh, <laughs> almost an hour ago at this point, about how the, the father of Pianchi and Pianchi himself and his kids going all the way to Taharka and how does that coincide with the uh with the old testament and then you got that coincide with the new testament and then christ himself going in the, going into egypt and the prophecy in the old testament saying out of egypt i'm gonna call my son right and you got paul being mistaken as an egyptian uh or, or comedic to, to our brothers and sisters uh uh in the new testament so and you got an african man picking up the cross for jesus and uh when he when he drops it to bring it all the way to the thing you got Apostle Paul being uh, coached and, and and brought up by Africans like Apollos or whatever, you know, Apollos teaching Paul about the faith. Like we had this in the New Testament, but because we are disconnected from it, we don't see ourselves in it. And so even those who re- end up rejecting the faith, they don't have a connection back to Africa because that's really what it is. I'm, I'm going to call it what it is. Spade, spade. You don't have no connection back to Africa. Whether you want to be Hebrew, Israelite, Moors, you don't feel like you have a spiritual connection back to Africa. So therefore, you got to reject it. And I'm like, let's build that spiritual connection back. Either, if it's through Kemet, if it's through West Africa, if it's through North, South, whatever, build that back. At least build your historical knowledge so you out here operating in a truth and not having to apologize for your faith or what you believe in because of its association with the wrongness of a sect of people that have only been uh, only been in the faith for about four or five hundred years at best. And most of them got it wrong anyway. Mm. Well, you heard you heard what my brother said. He said what he said. And, and so and y'all know what it is with me. Uh, like I said, if it's African history, I'm here for the good, the bad, and the Christianity of it all. So let's not get it twisted. Christianity is a part of African history. And African people, like it or not, shaped and molded this spiritual tradition. And so now we can't help how it was co-opted and weaponized 
against indigenous people all around the world. But we know for a fact that African people shaped and molded it into what it is. And again, it was co-opted and weaponized. But we, as we've done since our inception, we moved the needle for spiritual culture and for societal culture on this planet, period. Like Pac said, if they could be black, then they would switch. But lucky enough, we ain't got to worry about that because we was born black. So I just want to say I appreciate you coming on, brother. This was uh, this was a great show. Uh, if nobody else enjoyed it, I did because it was it was uh, educational, and uh, I learned a lot. And um, we definitely gonna have you back on for that for that second conversation between yeah. you and I as far as the the black church and why. I have it over here and I got the rest of Christianity over here and we'll, we'll get into that and uh, break that down. So y'all look forward to that conversation. Uh, let the people know what you got going on as far as your work in the community, social media, all of that. Man, uh, man, I, I got my open market coming back, coming up on the 31st. Again, it's a, it's in Baton Rouge, it's called Scotland Saturday. It's, it's, a, it's a monthly entrepreneur um, market um, for small businesses as well for the culture. So we got a lot of artists coming out. Uh, like this month, we're honoring some youth uh, uh, youth poetry uh, team is going to be spitting. And we got a youth, uh, a young comedian. Uh, he going to do a set for the people. And, I, you know, it, it's back to school time. So we want to honor the kids and stuff like that. So, man, yeah, we're just doing stuff in the community. Uh, like I say, I, I, don't, I don't like to brag on a lot of stuff. I just do my stuff and just, you know, let the chips fall where they may. Well, he don't like to brag, but we're going to brag on the brother. The brother doing uh, big time work in this community. Uh, y'all support him any way, any way you can. Brother, if you got a cash app or a PayPal where people can donate, throw it out there. And uh, I'm like, I'm dead serious. Like, this brother, oh, support, <laughs> support our brother any way you can. That said, this has been another episode of Paradigm Shift TV 314. Y'all know me. It's your brother, Pianki Patai Moon, Two Nefer Moon Ra. That's my boy, B. Wash, and we'll be black at it again. Till next time, that's peace. We out. Uh -huh.